Welcome to Mental Health News Radio. I'm your host, Kristen Sinanta Walker. Just what are we going to discuss? The intimacy that is mental health. Let's continue to make it as comfortable as discussing brain health or heart health. This show has been on the air for several years and we have amazing co hosts. And then we created a network of podcasters on mentalhealthnewsradionetwork.com, a place where every possible facet of mental well being can be talked about openly. My show, after several hundred interviews, the format is this intimate, deep, funny, touching, sometimes uncomfortable, but always vulnerable conversations with interesting people. The goal is to have you, our listening family, many of you who have become my good friends, feel as though you are listening in on private conversations. Thank you for tuning in and becoming part of this amazing journey with me and now with our network of podcasters. Just knowing this podcast might be helping any of you realize you are not alone on this journey called being a human being makes doing this podcast worth every second. Hey everyone, this is Kristen Sinanta Walker, host of Mental Health News Radio, and I am here with my now new co-host, Sherry Botwin. Sherry, thanks so much for coming on again. Thanks for having me back. Just tell everyone real quick where you're at today. You're in your car at what trial? So I'm sitting in my car um, at the Cosby trial, witnessing probably a life-altering experience for many people. Absolutely. And we did a show about this not too long ago that was intense. And then you bring even more incredible guests on our show. So Phil Saviano, um, thank you so much for coming on the show. Hello. I'm glad to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. And also, uh, we have Michael Resendiz. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Sherry, how did you all how did you all meet? I'm going to turn that part over to you. So I've been working with trauma survivors for 20 years. And not that long ago, I started getting a whole bunch of men coming to see me who were childhood abuse survivors. And I've always been interested in the topic and done so much work on stories like the Cosby trial. But once I started meeting more and more men who were coming to me after having kept quiet maybe 10, 20, 30 years, their history with childhood sexual abuse, I thought it was time to really focus on what it's like to be a man and have to live with this kind of trauma. And one day, not that long ago, I was sitting with a patient who told me that he went to see the Spotlight movie. He said there were about maybe six people in the movie theater. It was a summer weekday, six men in the movie theater. And he went on to tell me how when the movie ended, each man just sort of got in line, walked out of the movie theater. No one was able to look each look at each other in the eye. There was no type of contact. And as soon as I heard that story, I knew that I wanted to do some more speaking and interviews on this because the shame that my patient felt and the the sadness and the and the shame that I imagined that all those men felt when they walked out of that room was was very intriguing, something I can certainly relate to, but also in some ways maybe I can't as a woman who's a survivor. So in thinking about doing a podcast, I thought, well, who would be a good person or what what organization would I want to reach out to? So I went and watched the movie and was totally intrigued and inspired by Phil's story by Mike and his role in the story and just sort of sat at my computer one day and said, how do I find these guys? So went online and found somebody at the Boston Globe who was very nice and forwarded me the information that led me to Mike and Phil. So that's kind of how we ended up here today. Well, let's do this just so our listeners know. Phil, do you mind giving a little bit about your history with our audience? Sure. Um, 
Well, I grew up in a small town in central Massachusetts, and um, I was from an Italian Catholic family. I was a newspaper boy, not an altar boy. And in uh, early 1964, a new priest was assigned to our parish, whose name was David Hawley. And um, over the course of the next uh, 18 months, um, I was uh, sexually assaulted by him on on numerous occasions. Uh, Mm -hmm. I went through a process of grooming where he sort of uh, um, drew me closer, and I went through a process of feeling fortunate and lucky that this well-respected man was paying attention to me, of course, having no idea where it was going to end up. Um, I went through this experience, and I always remembered what had happened to me, but I always downplayed the impact, not only in terms of my emotional health, but in terms of uh, his uh, future after he left my hometown. And all this sort of came crashing in in late 1992 when I saw a story in the Boston Globe about a couple of victims from New Mexico that he had assaulted some 10 years after I knew him. And uh, then I began to realize that uh, he had had a very long career. Of doing this, states, right. Always assaulting mm-hmm. victims. And um, so I decided to go public, which was a very big step for me. Uh, it was a story that ran on the front page of the Globe, and then it was picked up by the Associated Press. And in within about six weeks, the, the story and my photo were on the front page of USA Today. And uh, I realized that I was very deep in an issue that I really didn't know that much about. Right. So I went through a process of educating myself. Um, I filed a lawsuit. I went through discovery, uh, learned that there were seven bishops and in four states that knew that this man was a child molester. Um, I settled my my lawsuit and I retained my ability to talk about what I had learned by not signing a confidentiality agreement. And that set me up to uh, formalize my outreach. Uh, 1997, I I started the New England chapter of the National Support Network, Survivors Network of Those Abused by Priests, and uh, started holding support groups over time became sort of the go-to person in the Boston area for the news media. Right. And um, in, the summer of ni- in the summer of 2001, uh, I received a call from Walter Robinson, who was the head of the Globe Spotlight investigation team. Sort of an, an initial call just to see who I was and what I knew, and um, very quickly was invited in to meet with the rest of the team in what was nearly a four-hour meeting. Hmm. Um, that's sort of recreated in that spotlight film. Right. And um, so it like, pretty much brings us up to date, I think. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Phil. I mean, uh, I've talked about childhood sexual abuse since I was 14, and I'm 47, so the time that I started talking about it, it was not okay to talk about it, especially about you know someone like your father. So um, I can understand from that perspective, and I know... Sherry experienced that as well, which we've shared on the show, and yet another reason why we were honored that you'd come on and talk about this yet again, because I know you've talked about it for a long time. Yeah, since like 1992, although I'm starting to get better at it. (laughs) (laughs) I know it's something to get better at, I know, but you always think, okay, if I get better at this, I can reach more people, so... Yeah, right. I, I hear you. So, Mike, tell our listeners a little bit about your background. Well, I also grew up uh, in a Catholic family. Um, I think uh, both my mother's side and my father's side, are. there are many devout Catholics. We went to church every Sunday. We didn't eat meat on Friday and all of that. And I guess uh, by the time I got into university at Boston University, I, I started to become skeptical of the Catholic Church for variety of reasons. Many of them were political uh, in nature. And I started my uh, career in journalism first at a very small uh, neighborhood crusading paper and eventually landed at the Boston Globe and landed on uh, the Boston Globe Spotlight Team, where I've worked essentially uh, more or less uh, for the last uh, 16 or 17 years. When we began our investigation of the Catholic Church, I really didn't know anything about sexual abuse at all, and certainly not the sexual abuse of children. So it was a new subject to me. Uh, Usually, 
when I begin a spotlight investigation, it is a new subject for me, and there's always a learning curve. And uh, I have to say that Phil was very, very helpful uh, in educating those of us on the Globe Spotlight team and also uh, motivating us to do uh, the best job that we possibly could. If you've seen the Spotlight movie, you see Phil comes in and and Mm -hmm. talks with us, and he's got a lot of evidence, and that was very, very important. What you don't see in the film is that uh, Phil also told us his personal story of abuse by David Holly, And I think we were all incredibly moved by his story, incredibly angry. And when we left, I think we were incredibly driven to get to the bottom of things. Phil, Um, did did you feel that, Phil, when you were telling the story that you were actually capturing their attention, that someone was hearing you and they weren't just hearing you, but they were being motivated to take this and do something, you know, advocacy around this? That was a remarkable experience for me. And I have a very clear memory at one point of sitting and I'm sort of in in the reporters are sort of sitting around me in a half circle. Mm -hmm. And I'm and I'm talking, and as the words are coming out of my mouth, I'm looking around, and each one of the reporters is taking notes. And I thought, wow. And, you know, this was something that I had really, <laughs> you know, I, I had known early on that there was a cover-up and that it was nationwide and that the bishops were in on it, and a, a lot of these priests were being protected and just moved around and given opportunities again and again to get access to, to children. And... I had a hard time getting that message out or, or getting getting that viewpoint uh, respected. And I can certainly understand in retrospect, you know, just the concept that a bishop or, or a cardinal would know about this and not take action to protect kids was it's really very difficult for people to come to terms with. Absolutely. Um, but I finally, you know, I felt that in this meeting, uh, for, the, for the first time, I was really being taken seriously. And as I said, the meeting went on for almost four hours. And I think after like maybe uh, three hours into it, they sort of turned the tables on me. And Walter (laughs) said, Mr. Robinson said, well, Phil, um, can you tell us a little bit about what happened to you? What were your own personal experiences? And that was uh, that was that was nerve wracking for me because I, I I I was there representing other victims, telling other stories. And suddenly it turned very personal and I started telling the story and I lost it. I started crying and I'm thinking, oh, this is so embarrassing. I can't, I can't seem to rein in my emotions. And, um, As if but, you know, you ever should. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think it, you know, it, it made a point. And one of the points was that the pain is often just below the surface. Yes. And that's yeah. true with many of us. Many of us. Uh, I think one of the things that can happen too, when you spend so many years keeping things silent or pushed away under wraps, when you start talking about it, and it sounds like when you were in that room and you realize you're telling your own story, you, you can get hit with feelings in a way that almost feels like the floodgates are just opening up. Yeah. I know I've experienced I that. Tell you. Yeah. It was surprising to me when I just <laughs> yeah. found myself overwhelmed by these emotions. Yeah. Mike, what were you thinking th- when he opened up and started talking about his story? Well, I felt a great deal of empathy, uh, and I also felt a great deal of emotion. I'd, I'd begun doing some reporting on this, and I'd also read about other uh, clergy abuse scandals in different parts of the country, including Fall River, Massachusetts. So, you know... As, as Phil talked about what had happened to him, and it's really an awful, heartbreaking story, my empathy began to turn to anger that this could mm-hmm. possibly happen right. and that and that and that Father Holy could have more victims uh, all over the country. I mean, I just started to get more and more angry. And by the time we got out of that meeting, uh, I was really determined, uh, as I said, to get this story. And Phil brought a lot of research materials for us. And I began to go through those research materials and included among them was a 70 page document. It was expert testimony in the case of a uh, serial abuser in Texas by the name of Father Rudy Koss. And the expert testimony was written by uh, a man named Richard Seip, who was a former priest and psychotherapist. Mm -hmm. And when I read this document, I thought, wow, this is my guy. This uh, This is the expert we need. And uh, I got in touch with Richard and I had a phone call with him and 
in the middle of the phone call, I interrupted him and I said, wait, um, you have to come to Boston. Richard Seip lives in California. I said, the Boston Globe is going to, and I did this with no authority. I said, the Boston Globe is going to fly you uh, to Boston, put you up in a hotel so that you can come and talk to the Globe Spotlight team. So, you know, Phil, uh, Phil gave us, uh, not only did he inspire us uh, and give us a lot of great information, but it, also he just, he gave us uh, a way forward. And that was invaluable. Absolutely. It sounds to me like when you say, you know, it's heartbreaking to listen to what he's sharing, but then as you're going through the experience, you find yourself getting in touch with the anger about what happened to him and so many others. And I think that's what, when you said you were determined, you're using all that anger about what you're hearing. Even if you're not someone that's been through that, you're certainly an empathic person. And look at the power that came out of that, all that anger and determination. Look, look what you were able to do with that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Anger, anger turns out to be a pretty good fuel if it's directed in the appropriate way. (laughs) Exactly. Um, Exactly. Hey, anger is what started this podcast. (laughs) You know, I had a similar feeling in this, in the, in the, in the spotlight movie, you can also see me talking to uh, a young guy by the name of Patrick McSorley. And he was telling me the story of his abuse abuse and how uh, Father John Gagan seduced him. And it was just outrageous. I mean, John, Father John Gagan was hanging around in the neighborhood and he heard from Patrick McSorley's sister that their father uh, had recently committed suicide. And uh, Patrick Predator uh, on patrol, that's what I call it. Yeah, uh, predator on patrol, exactly. And Patrick's mother, by the way, suffered from uh, paranoid schizophrenia. It was a Ugh. very, very difficult uh, family. And so John Gagan rushes over to the house ostensibly to express his sympathy, but what he really saw was an opportunity. Absolutely. And he took, he mm-hmm. took, Patrick, out for, he took Patrick out for an ice, cube, ice cream cone and he molested him in the car on the, on the way back to his uh, apartment, which was in a public housing project. And uh, I thought this was just outrageous. I mean, just completely uh, outrageous. And, uh, you know, that was another instance where someone's abuse and their ability to talk about it, which is so critical, yes. really, helped, uh, really helped our investigation. I have to say, uh, one of the most chilling moments in the movie is, is occurs after I finish my meeting with Patrick and the lawyer, Mitchell Garabedian, says to me, he's one of the lucky ones. He's still alive. Right. And he's referring, of, of yeah. course, to all the abuse victims who commit suicide. But the reason that's right. so chilling for me is that Patrick McSorley now is dead uh, after having oh. taken his life. Yeah, I know. I read about that. Oh, and uh, that's the piece, because I remember sitting in rooms like that. And at the time that uh, I turned in my father, I was investigated at my school, but my father, no one ever talked to him. And I'll tell you who my wow. fr- my friends were. My friends were journalists uh, because they would wow. listen to what I had to say, write it down. Uh, you know, I mean, that those were the memories I have of these people are listening to me. The police are not. Uh, my school isn't. I had one teacher that was, but um, it was the people that were taking the notes. <laughs> so I learned those people are my friends because they will write things that maybe mm-hmm. no one wants to read, but um, someday someone will take this seriously. So, yeah. ah, um, Phil, the part- I think I'm, uh, let's- I was going to say, I feel like I'm, go ahead. Sorry. No, 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 no you're, each other off. you're, we're <laughs> fine. That's why Emily, Emily, <laughs> I want to get into this piece, Phil, with you about the grooming, because I know that Sherry Mm -hmm. totally understands that, and I totally understand Mm -hmm. it as well. And I think that people still don't understand the level of mind screw it is to, over time, be systematically groomed by a predator, and that people, there are people out there that do evil things um, like this, and that they are actually looking for this and profiling you. So yeah. when you realize that you were, you know, being profiled and that you were um, being groomed, was there a <clears throat> shift in how you looked at what happened to you in terms of how you felt oh. about yourself? Oh, yes. And it it was, you know, I remember that shift at the age of 12 because mm-hmm. um, 
I'm so glad you you brought this up because this was one of the the important, so important things that I wanted to work into my dialogue in the film, the concept of grooming. Yes. That the, just one day put the moves on a kid. No, it's uh, tired no, little, it's really little a, digs and zings and things that happen over time that, that get you to the yeah. place where they know. And it's like, it's a high for them. They know I got them. That's the high. Yeah. Well, part of it, I think, is, is you know, it's a slow process. And it starts out with the priest. In my case, you know, I was a priest paying attention to me. And this, this man so highly regarded, so well respected within the community. And of course, it, it, when he arrived in town, I was still 11 years old. And, um, you know, having been indoctrinated in all, all the uh, religious beliefs, I felt that this was the guy that stood between me and God. Absolutely. Was, in fact, I, you know, he was second to God. He was, he was, he, he was the pathway to, to uh, salvation and forgiving yep. sins. And, you know, he could perform the miracle of changing the wine to the blood of Christ. And, you know, it was there at all the, the most important family events, the weddings, the funerals, the baptisms. And so um, when he started, you know, taking an interest in me, uh, which took the form of asking me one, it, it began one morning after CCD classes when he asked me to stay behind and help him move some boxes. He had some things up in the choir loft that had to be moved down to the storage room in the basement. And uh, boy, I felt really, I, I felt kind of special that he asked me out, out of everybody else in the class. And of course, during that hour long process, he asked a lot of questions about school and my family and who my friends were and i think he was just sort of feeling me out yep to see uh to what degree mm -hmm. i was going to reveal part of my 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 personal life uh in my case and i think in a lot in the cases of a lot of children that end up getting abused there are issues in the family yes the, the, the issue in my yep. case was that my my mother was was quite sick she had a very bad case of rheumatoid arthritis so I didn't have, you know, quite the level of supervision that other kids my age might mm -hmm. have had. And, um, yeah, I was more vulnerable. And um, so anyways, you know, one thing led to another. And uh, I finished the, the, the chores. He sent me off with a 50 cent reward, which in those days was pretty good because, you know, I was <laughs> yeah. a newspaper boy. And I was going to say, wait a minute, that week. Book. <laughs> All I would get was five dollars, so fifty cents for an hour. I thought, well, this is great. Um, but what I didn't realize was that this was the beginning of a uh, a road that was going to lead, you know, pretty much to disaster for me. And of course, a couple more times of uh, you know helping with chores. And um, one of the things about Father Holly was that he had an unusual personality trait. He was able to bring himself down to the level of a child in terms of the funny stories, the stupid things he would be interested in. Um, and in his case, he was really good at card tricks. Now, I don't know too many 11, 12 year olds these days that would be that interested in card tricks. But in those years, you know, right. mm -hmm. before the internet and smartphones, card tricks were pretty cool. <laughs> And uh, that was his entree yeah. because after, you know, after a few days of, of card tricks with me and a couple of my other friends, um, one day that deck of cards uh, turned out to be a deck with pornographic pictures on it. Yeah. But, but what, what that did was it suddenly we had a, a, a secret that we were sharing right. with the priest. You know, we knew that, that uh, it was, say, naughty. For a priest to have a deck of cards like this, but did we want to see the pictures? Yeah, we did. Yeah, right. And right. so we sort of, point. you know, we made a little bargain that we were going to, you know, we were going to keep the secret. We weren't going to tell our parents, and he was going to show these cards to us. And um, I think in some ways we felt even closer with him because he was sharing this secret with us. You know, from his point of view, uh, this was great because that was that that was the beginning of of his conversations with us about sex. What did we know? What did we want to know? Right. Uh, eventually, the cards got even more pornographic in nature, and it led to the you know to the day when standing in the 
uh, I think it's called the, I don't know, the entrance of the church. There were three of us kids. And um, he exposed himself to us. Right. And we didn't run away. Right. We thought it was pretty weird, but no, we didn't run away. And, um, well, eventually over time, things degenerated to a, a, a situation that was pretty horrible, that we were very, very, well, a combination of uncomfortable, scared, grossed out, embarrassed, ashamed, but could not figure out how to get out of it. Yeah. And part of the reason for that was, is the power dynamic, you know? Yes. Like my, my. Like the actor in the film says, how do you say no to God? Right. Right. But, you know, one of the things that I feel like you're talking about as you're talking about the grooming process, even now in 2017, I have a little guy. Schools teach kids about, you know, stranger danger. You know, don't go, don't be getting in a car with somebody that you don't know. Be mindful of who you're speaking to. But one of the things we still don't teach kids is how to decipher or how to understand the difference between appropriate and inappropriate. We teach it within a certain context, but when you're already in a relationship with somebody, whether it's your parent or a priest or a mentor, they don't teach kids what they're supposed to do when they're starting to feel like, even though this is a person that I think cares about me and a person that I value, what am I supposed to do if I start getting that sick feeling in my stomach? Because kids as young as five and six will feel those emotions when they're being violated, but nobody's teaching them what to do with those feelings. And like when you're talking about the relationship that you have and also the coming from a family where there's a circumstance where maybe you're not getting all the attention or nurturing that you need, you're more likely to stay in that connection just because you need it and you're wanting that attention. So it's something that I've been sitting here listening to you. It really makes me very sad because I think as much as we are focusing more on sexual assault and we're talking more about it, about girls and boys, you know, one in five boys, one in three girls will, will go, go through something like this. We're still not teaching kids what to do and how to know when something's just not right. Well, the, you know, that's the thing. I, initially, I liked the attention, but I right. had no idea where it was going to. And then once I right. got there, which, which was in my case was repeated episodes of oral sex where I was performing the oral sex, uh, I, 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 I could not figure out how to get out of it. And right. because of that right. power dynamic, you know, I could say to him, no, I can't do this. I've got to go home. I'm going to be late for supper. I've got to get back to my paper route, whatever. But I never had it within me to yell at the guy or to be really mm -hmm. forceful, like, you know, I'll kick him in the shins and go tearing out of the church. I just, I, I, I just couldn't, you know, it was hard enough to say no to a priest without yelling at him or hitting him. We're taught to be quiet. I mean, I, I had an incident when I was pregnant with someone in a nail salon uh, that reached into my bra and fondled me and my husband. And this is after me doing years of speaking. And my husband was like, why did you let that happen? And, and I said, I, I just couldn't. I, I was so I just couldn't. Now, if anybody did that to me the, you know, clippers would be right there in their eyeball. But at that time. I was I was 19 and just like <gasps> so yeah you don't know what to you know, do. That's such a good point because I had a similar situation when I was you know a young adult probably I don't know 22 where I found myself in a situation where mm -hmm. I was I ended up getting well it's kind of a long story but maybe I'll just summarize it I it, this was in the process of trying to you know I was. I think I, I was really shut down emotionally for a number of years after Father Holly was through with me. And, um, you know, as it turned out, I, 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 it turned out that I was gay, but the process of figuring out what am I, who do I, who am I interested in right. was very, very difficult for me. And, um, just, you know, putting myself in, in a situation that had anything to do with sex made me feel very, very anxious. Absolutely. But I was I, trying to sort of force myself through it. And so I came up with a situation where 
I went to my first gay bar in Boston. I hitched in from Amherst, two hour hitchhike, and stranded myself in the city with no money, no place to sleep. And I said, okay, Phil, now you're going to be forced to have this experience and figure out do you like it or not. Right. And what happened was I got myself into a situation where I was sexually assaulted by two right. older guys. And I was brought right back to that childhood situation where I couldn't figure out how to how to stand up for myself. Exactly. I couldn't right. figure out how to say no in a way that would be listened to. And it was it just carried me right back to when I was twelve years old. Yep. Really painful. Um, I think I said earlier that that I always remembered what had happened to me as a child. But so here I am in my twenties, you know, having all these issues <laughs> mostly right. regarding sex right. or you know self esteem yep. or whatever. And I didn't have a clue that the the problems right. that I was having were related to my yeah. childhood abuse. Yeah, I wasn't able to link them. And he, and you know. Even even in my 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 thirties, when I was I had some pretty I was in public relations and I and I worked for a hospital and I worked for a PR firm and you know I thought I was pretty hip and sophisticated <laughs> and I was well traveled and so on. But as far as this particular issue and its impact on me, right up until I was age forty, I was still clueless. I I, I halfway through my life, I I, I turned out to. Uh, be HIV positive, so then I had that to contend with. Okay. And um, I remember in in therapy, my psychiatrist, uh, she really wanted me to talk about my childhood, and I sort of mentioned the Father Holly situation, you know, in, in passing, summarizing my childhood, and she wanted me to really delve into it in great detail. And I said, why? Why would you want? You know, I'm he, I'm having a crisis as an adult. I've got this terminal illness. I'm trying to figure out, you know, how to how to plan what what good years I have left, and I really don't want to spend my time in here talking about my childhood. I don't think it's that relevant. Oh, right. <laughs> I hear you. Same. Well, I've said the same thing. <laughs> yeah. When I found myself in 1992, uh, realizing that it was important that I come out with my story, partly to support the, the kids in New Mexico who were talking about their, ex their experiences 10 years after mine, um, uh, then, it, then I, you know, I figured, well, I better figure out, I better get serious about this and uh, went, into, went back into therapy and agreed to start talking about my childhood. And uh, eventually, you know, I, I can see all the connections, certainly now. But um, I think a lot of us have that that same yeah. experience. Absolutely. You know? we, we go through these horrible experiences as children, and then we don't, we, we sort of downplay them or we devalue them, block them out. And uh, right. we really don't want to admit that that childhood thing has had the lasting impact on us. <laughs> the most impact of yeah and, and I always think Nobody, okay right. go go to the original person you know for me it was go to go back to my father it originated with him and he, work on healing that wound and every horror filled relationship not not that I've had all of them I've had wonderful ones too but everyone that was horrible that was another abusive relationship okay. those got healed just by me working on the original relationship <laughs> Mm -hmm. So, um, Mike, I wanted to ask you, you know, one of the things that you do when you're, you know, interviewing anyone, um, you're seeing a pattern of behavior and you interviewed so many victims of this and you did this over time also. So what kinds of things did you see from each victim and also from each of the abusers in terms of like patterns of behavior that they all had that were similar? Well, there's definitely a pattern among the survivors, and, and, and I think Phil is ex Exhibit A. I mean, usually when people, particularly men, are ready to come forward and tell their story and try to get some justice, uh, they are typically in their 40s or, or even older. I, I think it's very yeah. difficult for a variety of reasons for people, and especially men who are younger, uh, to confront this. And uh, so that, that's something I see over and over and over again. And I remember one case, there was a, an abuser by the name of uh, Father Paul Mahan. And through some court documents, I discovered some of his, uh, some of his victims. 
And I, they were in their early 20s, and I made contact with them, and they just didn't want to talk about it, you know. And, and uh, you know, I remember one guy saying to me, hey, look, you know, I just got my first job, and, you know, things are going pretty good, and I, I just don't want to get into this. And, and of course, uh, I respected that, but I also was thinking in the back of my mind, well, you know, 20 years from now, uh, you're probably going to want to talk about this. Right. But you know, even as somebody who never went through this, you know that, that the impact it's probably having on that person's life. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it just um, happens over and over again where, where people, uh, they get into their 40s and they realize, wow, I've had all these difficulties and all, all these problems and my marriage hasn't been so hot. And, and uh, you know, I get very angry at work and and uh, people start putting it together and, and connecting it to the, the abuse they suffered as, as children or teenagers. And it just takes a, a long time, as Phil said, for people to put it all together. And I think the reason for that is because the initial abuse is so traumatizing. Yes. Who would want to dwell on it? Who would want to think about it? And who would want to think that that sort of abuse would have those kinds of repercussions? We all like to think we are in control of our lives and we define who we are. And when we discover that, no, we don't, uh, it's, um, it's, it's uh, psychologically uh, disruptive and it's, it's unnerving. So, um, I just think uh, for the, all those reasons, it takes a long time for people to come to terms uh, with what's happened. And often, because of that, they're unable to file uh, lawsuits because the statute of limitations right. has expired. And so, you know, there's a lot of problems that come with that. And then it, there's the whole issue of does the person want to uh, confront uh, their abuser or not? And is the abuser still alive? Is the abuser around? Uh, you know, there are a lot of issues that, that are connected with that. It, it ends up being a, a big piece of work that people have to get through. Just by sitting in the uh, Cosby trial and, um, you know, hearing all the cross-examination, there, you have to be really, really in a, in a, in a good spot in your own life to be able to work through some of these issues. You have to have the willingness and the strength and um, when you're talking about the statute of limitations, it's it's been coming up in the trial. There's a lot of questions why in 2005 and then now again in 2015. And I think from what you're saying, Mike, you're affirming what I wish they were saying in the courtroom. Um, it can take people, it usually takes people years to even know for themselves that something has happened. So to expect that someone's going to be able to just go and make a report within a certain amount of time. I think that's one of the things that um, is very important about states ending the statute of limitations to make a report like this, because I think we're starting to realize that this is not something you can put a time no. time limit on. You can't expect somebody, okay, by this date, you need to be able to do this, this, and this. And I think, again, you know, Phil, from what you're saying, it, it can take such a long time after the the abuse ends to even let ourselves know once you start opening up and you t once you start talking to people, all, all the risks that come with that. I mean, when somebody is trying to open up about their abuse, it, it sounds like when you were sitting in the room with the reporters, you got, a t you know, a ton of support and acknowledgement. That, uh, some of the saddest stories that I've heard are, uh, people who have been abused uh, as children by priests and told their parents and were not believed. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and I, I think not being, you know, the disbelief on the part of parents is particularly uh, devastating. And, yeah. and uh, some of those people have had uh, really, really uh, a rough time. And, and uh, I know one in particular who's not around anymore. And it's really because uh, his parents just didn't believe him. They weren't capable of believing that a priest would sexually right. abuse their child or any child. And that, that, that in some ways is worse than the abuse itself. Bad enough to have to go through it. But when your own parents Don't can't hear you. what you're telling them, yeah. to me, I mean, I, I, when, I, when I think about what happened to me and my experience, I say that a lot now. It's not what happened to me itself that has left me at times going into that you know, state of despair or feeling like I'm going to unravel. It's that feeling of being disbelieved and not being protected by people who are supposed to take care of me. That's the piece I find, I find the most troubling. When, and when you don't get that, 
uh, as right. you said, it's it's as it's as bad as the abuse, or it could be worse. It's just devastating when your own family won't believe you. In the eyes of a child who's gone through this experience, the two places that should be the mo- where where he should feel the most safe, the most respected, the most mm-hmm. believed are the church and then the family yep. home. And when he's yep. assaulted in the church, and then he goes for help to his parents. And they don't believe him or they call him a liar or, you know, it's not a positive reaction uh, in the minds of the of the kid. They're left out there completely alone, yes. basically, right. to figure out how to deal with this themselves. And it's very, very difficult to figure out to sort all this stuff out when you're 10, 11, 12 years old. When, in my case, I, I made a decision that uh, going to my parents was not a good idea because I felt mm-hmm. that somehow I would end up getting blamed for it. And also because I was a newspaper boy, I knew a lot of people in that little town. And I was convinced that uh, if I told my father, um, he would probably, because he, 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 this was this was a pretty good prediction of his personality, he would go down to the church and he would probably punch the guy out. Right. Which yeah. is fine, except that the whole everybody town was going to know about it, and, yeah. and everybody, all those adults in my in my circle, would know that I had been sexually assaulted by this priest, and I would have to still live there because I was at that point only in the sixth, seventh grade. Um, all that exposure, yeah, the worst thing for someone who's been through what you've been through to have to feel that, that exposed. And and you know his his interesting thing is when I finally turned forty and decided that I was going to it was time to come out with my story and uh, I told my father for the first time at age forty what had happened to me as a kid. Uh, wouldn't you know he got really angry with me, and uh, he said, "Oh, well, that, you know, just just put it behind you, and, you know, try not to think about it." I said, "Well, actually." Um, I did an interview with the Boston Globe yesterday. It's going, you know, it's going to come out in the newspaper. <laughs> and he had a fit. He was really angry with me, and oh, um, he accused. You know, he came down pretty hard on me because I was bringing a scandal to my hometown. And I said to him, you know what, Dad? I didn't come to you when I was a kid because I, I just had the hunch that somehow I was going to end up getting blamed for this. And here we are, 30 years later. There you go. You're blaming me for it. But the difference is, is that I'm an adult now. I can stand up. I can make my own decisions. I can speak up for myself. And that's right. what I'm doing. So coming out yeah. tomorrow, get ready. Get ready. Exactly. <laughs> I want to make sure that we, because of what we talk about on the show, I want to just touch on, I know it's getting close to time, but you know, there are things that people can look for. Like I said earlier, patterns in people's behaviors. There are when an abuser's um seeking out. There's nothing like feeling like you're a meal for someone's addiction. I know exactly what that feels like. And Phil, I know what you feel. I know that you feel like that. You know what that feels like too. And Sherry, you also, and when you're groomed at such a young age, that behavior, that grooming, being a meal, being objectified in that way, that becomes normal as you, uh, that's normalized for you. Yeah. And right. so what I want to get to, though, is your patterns of behavior of predators. And, and I and I also want to honor that, yes, Phil, you're a survivor. All of these people are survivors. But it is also important to acknowledge that, yeah, we were once victims. You do have to wear that hat for a while um, and, and own it before you can move into the survivor stage. But I guess what I'm looking for is what as Mike, as you were um, interviewing different people, did you see patterns of behavior in the priests that were sim- similar in their personalities? Well, yes. Uh, I think uh, as, as in Phil's story and in Patrick McSorley's story and so many others, I think the priests are pretty shrewd. I think uh, sexual abusers are pretty shrewd Mm -hmm. and they look for vulnerable children. They look for children who, uh, as in Phil's case, do not have the supervision that they might otherwise have. They look for children who uh, have been uh, neglected that might be hungering for the attention uh, of a father and and not getting it at home, either because the father is absent or the father is very distant or the father is cruel. So I think the the reason this happens uh, so often with impunity, or at least it has over the last uh, 
decades and, and centuries is because the abusers are pretty shrewd in who they target and who they groom. They tend to you know be, there's, can't, there's, can't they be a little more dynamic in their behavior as well? They have a special touch, so to speak. I know that's a horrible way to put well, it, but a special think, touch with kids. Um, Phil, if you want to. Yeah, the thing that I recognized early on with Father Holly was, as I said earlier, he, he had the ability to bring himself, his personality down to that of a child. Yep. He was relatable. I, he told stupid stories and charming. funny jokes. Exactly. And, you, you know, uh, here's something that really stands out. The very first time we were introduced to him, uh, it was a sixth grade class. We were at the, the Saturday morning CCD lessons. Uh, we were being taught by nuns. And when Father Holly arrived, he, he went to all the classes that morning, just went from class to class. And um, it was in... You know, in that era when the priest walks in the room and everybody has to stand up. So I remember him coming into our room. We all stood up um, and he said to the nun, well, go ahead. You can continue with your lesson, continue with what you're saying. And as she's talking to us, he's standing slightly behind her, facing us and making faces at the nun so that we could see that he yeah. was making fun. Yeah. And he showed us on that very first day that he was approachable, he was a little mm -hmm. bit, uh, you know, not, not, his personality was, he was not the typical priest. He could bring himself down to our level. And uh, I think that that was just part of his, Shtick. I think it was all very well planned out. Yeah, they're, they have arrested development. Uh, that's when we get into terminology like, you know, malignant narcissism or sociopathy or psych, even psychopathy. Um, and I think Melanie, one of our, our counselors, said the other day, not every narcissist is a pedophile, but every every pedophile is a narcissist. Is a narcissist. And yep. I thought, you know, that that explains it. That five-year-old that did not ever grow up out of that five-year-old stage, and that is what gives them that ability to connect to a child. Now, not everyone right. that can do that is a pedophile or a narcissist, obviously, but that's the common theme, I guess, that I wanted to get out to our listeners is, you know, these, the the lurking around schools, the all the things that we've already said, but also that this is someone who is, has never uh, grown up. They live in, they're right. essentially, um, well, they are large grown up people with little kids running around in, inside of them. And that kid, that sick child is governing their lives. And that's what they're, you know, they're taking out that sickness on, on people around them. So thank and, you. And maybe for us, to just, maybe too, we can just, when we're talking to kids and not just little kids, but even, you know, 11, 12, 13 year olds, we need to just really make sure we explain to them. If you're in a situation where you don't really know how to describe what's going on and you don't, quite know what feels wrong about the situation, you still want to pay attention to that feeling. If you're getting a bad feeling, if your gut is saying, I don't like something about this situation, uh, like, please go tell somebody. And again, it might not be your parent, depending on where, who your family is, but that's something that I feel like whenever I think about kids or when I talk to kids or teenagers in my office, that's what I try to say to them. We are not wrong in what our intuition is telling us. And we, we are born with the ability to have intuition. I think because of what we've experienced in some ways, it gets shut down when you're going through the abuse. But if we can try to help younger people understand how to listen to that part of them, maybe we, we are helping them to do something sooner or find the right kind of support sooner. I think that's so important. And the other thing I want to say is you talked about stranger danger, but for the most part, it's not strangers that are putting the moves on, on children. Exactly. It's usually somebody that exactly. exactly. Phil, let's, uh, since we, mm -hmm. we do have to close, we're going over. Um, Phil, can you tell our listeners where is your advocacy taking you today and what are you doing tomorrow and let them know where they can find out more about you? Well, I'm actually, I'm out in California for a couple, visiting with Richard Seip, who we spoke about earlier. Right. He and I have become uh, very good friends in the life. Well, since the movie, basically. Um, if if people want to find out more about me and also have a good sort of a, uh, a good sense of what went on in Boston during the 1990s before Spotlight stepped up, um, they can check out my website. It's philsaviano.com. Um, there's all 
also a lot of there's, there's quite a bit of photos and stories about the movie as well. And I have a very active Facebook page, which is Facebook forward slash Phil dot Saviano, and that's S like Sam, A V like Victor, I A N O. Um, I've been doing some, you know, I've I've, I've I've had the opportunity to do quite a bit of speaking in the last year. Uh, I don't have anything on the books right now, but I certainly welcome an opportunity to, to continue to get the message out. Right. Absolutely. Thank you for coming on and doing this, Phil. This is awesome. You're welcome. I'm, I'm really pleased to have been asked, believe me. <laughs> Mike, how about you? I know you're actively uh, in doing investigative work for the Boston Globe, and you probably can't talk about any of it. but. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think well, actually, I, uh, I, I, that's correct. I'm still uh, an investigative reporter with the Globe Spotlight team, but there is something I can talk about, and I think it's appropriate right now because the last project I was involved in was an expose of the shortcomings in the Massachusetts mental health care system. Mm. And uh, the, the series oh. uh, was a, was a finalist for a Pulitzer Prize this year, and it was called uh, "The Desperate and the Dead." And I think if anyone just Google's uh, the Desperate and the Dead or Boston Globe Mental Illness, uh, the series will come up. Oh, that's awesome. Oh, I'd love to talk, have a show on that. <laughs> Whew. Okay. Well, how how would anyone find you? They would go Google your name, which is Michael, R-E-Z-E-N-D-E-S, and it'll take you right to Mike's um, Wikipedia page and straight to the Boston Globe. So, gentlemen, I want to thank both of you for coming on today. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. And, um, yeah, it's great to know about your your podcast. We'll yeah, other episodes. Absolutely, yeah. and stay on. We're going to chat for a second after. And um, but I want to say a special thanks to you, Sherry, for bringing really good history together so that we can talk about it and keep talking about it and keep talking about it. <laughs> yeah, and I just want to say to both of you because I know we haven't really had a lot of dialogue. I really do admire. Uh, what both of you have done in terms of just the role you play in the story and the way you've been able to get the word out. Um, I know that, you know, when that movie came out, I was jumping for joy and elated that finally, not only did this movie come out, but it's winning all of these awards. This tells me that we are finally really starting to deal more with this topic. And for me, that that makes up for any lack of information or education that I had growing up because it's out there now. So I really just want to make sure I say that to both of you. And I know that my patients who talk about your movie feel the same way. You know, the, the, well, other, great, uh, the other great thing is that that film has been an international hit. And I yes. know it's had an impact in many countries outside Amazing. of the United States. So the issue is, uh, the importance of this issue is certainly getting out there. Yep. And all of us on the Spotlight team are grateful for that. I think the most rewarding thing for us is how many survivors have told us that uh, they love the movie because it validates their story. Absolutely. I mean, every day, I would think there are many people out there that you don't hear from that feel that. And then I think that's, that's why I wanted to find you guys. So I'm so glad that you agreed to take this time and opportunity to talk with us. It really means a lot. Well, it's my pleasure. All right. My pleasure. And absolutely. Thank you to our listeners for sticking it out with us in over 170 countries, hearing more about myself and our co-host than you'd ever want to know, as, <laughs> as well as all of our guests. Thank you so much for tuning in to Mental Health News Radio. I know, I know, no one likes commercials, but seriously, folks, without the help from these organizations, we could not stay on the air. Please give a shout out to zencharts.com. If you're a mental health or addiction treatment center, you'll want to use their EHR. It's gorgeous. And they're just good people. And also mygenetics, M-Y-G-E-N-E-T-X.com, because knowing your genetic code empowers your mental health treatment. And lastly, copenotes.com. We love getting positive messages right to our phones every day from Johnny Crowder. He's the lead singer of Prison, a heavy metal band sharing their music about suicide prevention, addiction recovery, and mental health. See, that was painless. Support them as they support us. Back to the show. 
I'm passive aggressive, but never without good intentions. I heat up and act on my emotions. Thanks so much for listening to Mental Health News Radio. Our podcast can be found on iTunes, Stitcher, and hundreds of other podcast apps. Or you can visit our website at mentalhealthnewsradio.com. If you have a question or would like to be a guest, become a podcaster on our network, or join the amazing organizations that help keep us on the air, please email us at info at mhnrnetwork.com. Get ready for that special goodbye from our resident therapy dog, Miles, and a special thanks to Emily Sohn for letting us use her incredible song, Cordial, for our podcast music. Listen to the full song on SoundCloud at emily.sonne. Don't be surprised when I don't hate on you. After all we promised, we'd be cordial.